If you were trapped in a rundown hospital by a psychotic cult on the outside and horrific creatures inside, what would you do? Something is driving these people insane. And the worst part is that death is only the beginning. I'm here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the mutant death cult in the void. <laughs> These people are about to have the craziest night of their lives. Late one night at some abandoned farmhouse out in the middle of nowhere, this sketchy looking guy crashes through the front door and runs for his life. A woman tries to follow him, but before she can get away, two men come from the inside and shoot her in the back. The older guy, Vincent, grabs a gas can out of the truck and hands it to his son, Simon stepping away to smoke a cigarette while he covers the woman in fuel. When the kid's finished, he throws down his cigarette, burning the woman to death. And as they both get in his car to drive away, a strange person dressed like they're in some kind of cult watches from the distance. A little while later, this sheriff's deputy, Dan, is hiding out in the woods trying to get some sleep. When the injured man stumbles onto the trail in front of him, he turns on his spotlight and goes to check him out. But when the man looks up at him, he realizes that he needs to get this guy to a hospital. There's an emergency room nearby that's working short-staffed after a recent fire destroyed most of the building, but the next hospital is another 20 minutes up the road. So Dan tells dispatch to let the closer spot know that he's on the way. Okay, Dan doesn't know it yet, but by the end of the night, he's going to wish that he just left this guy in a ditch on the side of the road. He might not have seen what went down back at that trap house out in the woods, but based on the triangle painted on the inside of the front door, and that bedsheet wearing person watching from the tree line, it looks like his new friend was either involved with or trying to escape from some kind of deranged cult. You've probably heard of some of the more famous cults before, but could you survive being haunted by one? When we say cult, we're talking about a group of people with fringe religious beliefs who are completely devoted to their chosen leader. If you want to stop a cult, then the most important thing to do is to take out the one who's running the show. But Dan here is about to accidentally get involved in something that's even more insane. Now, common sense sense tells us that a guy doesn't just end up badly injured and lost in the middle of the woods this far from town so late at night unless he was involved in some pretty serious trouble. And that's why I'd make sure to question him about what happened as we drive him to the hospital. For all that we know, whoever messed him up like that could still be searching for him right now. And I definitely wouldn't want to be caught off guard when they came back for round two. He might not be fully coherent, but even if all that I could get was a few words out of him, it'd be helpful to have some idea of what I might be up against, and if I needed to call for backup before it's too late. The last thing that you want to do is be stuck out in the middle of nowhere with a gang of psychopaths hunting you down, which is exactly what's about to happen. The nurses see Dan carrying the man inside and rush over with a stretcher to bring him straight to the doctor. He still needs to question the guy since he has to make a report, so he sits down with the other patients to wait for any news. After a few minutes, he hears struggling and shouting from down the hall and goes to check it out. The man is in there fighting back as hard as he can, but the nurses hold him down while the doctor gives him a shot of sedatives and he falls asleep. Checking his wallet, they find out that his name is James, and he has scars from needles all over his arm, which freaks Dan out because he touched a lot of the guy's blood. The doctor says that James will be all right, but it's going to be a while before anyone can talk to him. Walking back to the lobby, he hears somebody crying from one of the rooms, and when he looks in, he sees this nurse Beverly standing over a patient covered in blood and pushing a pair of scissors into his eye. She turns around and starts pulling pieces of skin off of her own face as she walks towards Dan, about to stab him next. But before before she can get close, he takes out his pistol and shoots her once in the head. The rest of the nurses come running as Dan stumbles out into the hall. He tries his best to explain what happened, but quickly starts having a panic attack and ducks into the bathroom to catch his breath. He goes to the sink to wash his face when suddenly the whole room goes blurry and he passes out. While unconscious, Dan has visions of a dark alien landscape huge stretches of outer space, and black pyramids floating in the sky. The doctor shakes him awake, saying that it looks like he had a seizure and recommends that they should take him to a bed. But Dan insists that he'll be all right. A state trooper arrived while he was knocked out, so he goes to speak to him about the incident. Out in the hallway, he finds Trooper Mitchell already looking over the scene. The trooper explains that he came here to arrest James after finding the massacre back at the farmhouse. And since the man has drug-related crimes on his record, he thinks 
thinks that there might have been something in his blood that caused the nurse to go crazy. Protocol says that Dan needs to hand in his weapon after using it, so he turns his pistol over to the trooper and goes to make an official report with the station. Okay, this doesn't look good. What started out as a normal night just turned into a bloodbath in the span of 15 minutes. While everyone was focused on the crazy guy from the woods, something made Bev here lose her mind and go after an innocent patient before mutilating herself in a delusional episode. Mitchell points out that it could be related to illegal substances from the man's bloodstream, and that's why Dan and everyone else who came into contact with his blood should be getting themselves checked out before they snap too, especially since he seems to be experiencing seizures, hallucinations, and panic attacks himself. It didn't take long after bringing the man in for Bev to go on her rampage, so Dan, Allison, and the doctor each need to be placed into separate rooms and kept under close observation for at least the next 30 minutes to make sure they're all still mentally stable. Also, they should each be given a toxicology screening to see if any chemicals from the man's blood managed to get into their systems. Stimulants, which speed up the nervous system, and hallucinogens, which alter your perception of reality both have the potential to cause violent outbursts under the wrong conditions. Testing everyone who was exposed could help them to identify the source of the problem and take the proper steps to treat it. This could involve simply keeping the patient calm and hydrated while you wait for the symptoms to fade. Even though it's a little too late to save her now, they should also test a sample of Bev's blood to see what may have been in her system at the time she went berserk. Speaking of Bev, I'm not exactly sure that Dan here handled that situation in the best way possible, but since she was slowly approaching him with only a pair of scissors in her hand, couldn't he have tried to injure her with a hit to the arm or the leg instead of immediately going for the kill shot? Who knows, maybe she would have snapped out of it if she'd gotten to live for another few minutes. Sure, she would have been horribly scarred for the rest of her life and facing prison time for what she did to that kid, but it'd be better to bring her in alive than have to explain to your bosses how two people ended up dead within minutes of you arriving on the scene. There was one last detail that Dan mentioned that could have something to do with what's going on. If he was paying close attention, then he might have noticed that James was completely out of it for most of the trip, but started fighting back as hard as he could the minute that he saw the doctor here, almost as if he knew him already from somewhere else. It could be nothing, but this sticks out as immediately suspicious to me, and I'd be keeping a close eye on the doctor for the rest of the night just in case my gut instincts turned out to be right. Dan tries the phone in the office first, but for some reason, it's not working, so he radios back to Mitchell that he's going to try and reach the station from out in his car instead. He has no idea that he's walking straight into a trap. Sitting in the driver's seat, he calls dispatch over the radio several times, but no one responds. That's when he spots someone from the cult standing in the road a short distance away. As he steps out of the car to see what they're doing, the hospital's power suddenly goes out, and he hears a strange deep noise from somewhere in the distance. By the time that he looks back, the person is already rushing towards him with a huge dagger in their hand, knocking him to the ground and pushing it into his chest. Dan manages to throw the attacker off at the last second, but when he gets up, he sees a dozen more cultists on their way, forcing him to rush back into the hospital for help. Okay, Dan here really needs to work on his approach to sketchy situations. This is the second time in under an hour that he's left himself wide open for a shanking, and at this rate, he's going to end up with so many holes in him that he'll look like SpongeBob by the time they make it out of there. After everything that's already happened tonight, did he seriously think that it was a good idea to casually walk up to the strange person standing there in the empty parking lot who looks like they just got done auditioning to be a henchman in some kind of Amish squid game? The red flags couldn't have been more obvious, which is why I would have immediately gotten back in the car and locked the doors as soon as I saw that freak. The cruiser could be his only shot at getting away to safety, so I wouldn't want to let the cultists cut me off from it. Instead, I'd tell the guy to get on the ground using the police car's speaker while calling Mitchell over the radio to come back me up with his pistol. Since he didn't win the 1v1, now he's going to need some medical attention, so the only option left is to circle back inside and have the doctor patch him up. Once he's back on his feet, he and Mitchell should observe the situation outside and decide if they want to run, fight, or wait and hide. Dan's badly injured, but the doctor manages to stop the bleeding. Although the cultists have the building surrounded, for some reason they aren't trying to get in. 
That's when they hear James screaming from down the hall, and Dan and Mitchell run to check it out. The guy's desperately trying to break free, because what's left of Nurse Bev has completely mutated into a gory creature that's reaching for him with its tentacles. The trooper pops a few caps into it, but it doesn't seem to have much effect, realizing that the guy is about to be assimilated if he doesn't act fast. Dan rushes in and kicks off the rail that he's handcuffed to, shoving him out of the room and saving his life. Okay, what the hell kind of hospital are they running here anyway? Just when it seemed like the situation couldn't get any worse. You throw in a creature that looks like the Thing and a necromorph from Dead Space had a baby, and suddenly the army of knife-wielding maniacs outside doesn't seem so bad. It looks like Dan and Mitchell have a few different ways that they could choose to handle things here. The first option is to get the hell out of that hospital as fast as they can, which is going to mean fighting their way through the cult. They're definitely outnumbered, but they have their pistols, and it seems like the cultists are only armed with knives. So this gives them the advantage of being able to thin them out from a distance. With a quick glimpse that we got at each of their weapons, it looks like they're both carrying Berettas, which should have a magazine capacity of about 15 rounds each. If they run out of ammo, they could always resort to the fire axe and hose from the lobby to finish things the old-fashioned way. If they're planning to stay inside, then they'll have to do something about Mutant Bev here. She seems pretty difficult to damage. They could try trapping her in the room by using their handcuffs to attack attach a stretcher to the knob horizontally across the doorway from the outside. Since we don't really know how strong the creature is yet, it might not be able to break its way out, as long as it's contained within one area. Then, that problem is pretty much solved. Now, if it is strong enough to break out, then the only option left is to fight. Even though pistol rounds don't seem to be doing much, my first instinct would be keep shooting it until they're out of ammo. But since they should want to save those bullets for the cultists in case they need to escape, they could try chopping its limbs off, if it has any, although this would require them to get in close. If they'd rather keep their distance, one thing that always works is killing it with fire, and since they're in a hospital, there should be plenty of flammable liquids around to get them started. They could easily barbecue Alien Bev. The only problem here is that they wouldn't want to burn the whole place down in the process, but they do have a fire hose and extinguisher out in the lobby. They could use them to put out the flames once the creature was good and dead. The three of them run back to the lobby, and Dan says that he'd rather take his chances with the cultists than with the monster. But before they can even get through the front door, the two men from the farmhouse show up and start pointing a rifle at the crazy guy. He immediately takes to this girl Maggie as a human shield, and for a minute, nobody knows what to do. The doctor tries to reason with him, but suddenly the guy stabs him in the neck, and he falls to the floor, already losing a lot of blood. That's when the girl's grandpa steps in, grabbing his arm and punching his lights out with a nasty right hook. While they were distracted, the dead nurse snuck up on Mitchell and dragged him away down the hall. Dan grabs his axe and runs after the trooper, but it's already too late. When he turns the corner, he sees the monster eating Mitchell's brains with its tentacles, and tosses Dan into the wall like he's nothing. Lucky for him, Vincent and Simon come to back him up, the younger guy striking the creature with his axe while the old man reloads his rifle. Another blob of flesh starts to grow out of its back, and Vincent fires at it, blowing the mess into bloody chunks. Out of ammo, they lay into the creature with their axes, chopping over and over until it's finally dead before turning to decapitate Mitchell as well. Returning back to the lobby, they find out that the doctor didn't survive. The two men set their sights on James once again, and when Dan tries to get between them, the older guy drops him with the handle of his axe. He's about to kill him too, but the kid steps in and holds him back, even though the man insists that they can't trust anyone. Dan promises that they have no idea what's going on either, and since the most important thing right now is to make sure that the dead nurse doesn't come back again, they light her remains on fire and push them out into the parking lot on a stretcher. Okay, is there a doctor in the house? Dan here still thinks that he's on duty, and almost ended up dead for trying to protect James from the two men. I wouldn't want to get between these guys and someone that they're trying to kill. They seem well prepared, and like they're doing a good job of handling things so far, so if they want somebody dead, then there's probably a pretty good reason for it. Instead of trying to stop them, I would have just asked them why they were after James in the first place, and see if I could get any more useful information about what exactly the hell is going on around here. They may have gotten rid of Bev, but there's still one threat around that they aren't accounting for. 
the doctor. From the way that they burned the girl back at the farmhouse and then took Mitchell's head off, it seems like they've been doing whatever they can to make sure that anyone who dies doesn't get back up while no one's watching. It only makes sense then that they should do the same thing to the doctor, and that's why if it were me, I'd want to take care of him before moving on to anything else. Coming soon to a theater near you, how to beat official Patreon. All the guts, all the blood, all the screams, plus nasty extras. How to beat Patreon. Two times the shock, two times the terror, two times the subscription levels. Have a damn good day, and it only gets better. Both levels bid you welcome to pre-sales for ghoulish official How to Beat merchandise and support the evil scientists behind the How to Beat videos. It only gets better subscribers are invited to the X-rated party. Ad-free and uncensored videos to repulsive for all audiences are available on demand. How to Beat's Patreon. In space, no one can hear you scream, but on Patreon, everyone can see you bleed. How to Beat's Patreon. Join us if you dare. Back in the office, Dan tries his best to keep everyone calm, but Allison says that the girl Maggie is having pregnancy complications. If they don't get supplies from the med room soon, she and the baby could die. After making her promise to wait until he gets back, he goes to the two men and calmly explains the situation. Dan wants their help getting to the shotgun in his cruiser, but they're not willing to risk their lives without something in return, only agreeing to go after it if he promises to let them keep the weapon once they reach it. Outside, they see that things are a little bit more complicated than they expected. Someone moved Dan's car to the edge of the woods, forcing them to go far out from the safety of the hospital to get there. He hands the kid the keys to the trunk, telling him to grab the ammo while he goes for the weapon in the front seat, and they quickly start running for the vehicle. Meanwhile, Allison decides that they don't have time to wait, and heads for the med room by herself. She manages to make it in there in one piece, but while she's distracted grabbing the supplies, the doctor's reanimated body shows up and takes her. The men get to the car and Dan turns on the emergency lights, revealing an army of cultists watching them from the shadows. While the kid grabs the supplies from the trunk, one of the crazies sneaks up behind him and slices his hand, but Dan blasts them with the shotgun just in time, telling the others that he's keeping it as they all run back inside. Okay. That was a close call. They may have made it back alive, but they lost Allison in the process. And besides getting their hands on the shotgun, they're really not in a much better position than they were before. Dan and the others missed an important opportunity to give themselves an advantage in the fight by circling around to grab his and Mitchell's pistols from the man's corpse back down in the hall. Since they've already gotten rid of Bev, there would be no threat stopping them if they'd also burned the doctor's body like they should have. After a quick detour to retreat the guns, then they would have been much better prepared for the trip out to the cruiser, or could have even skipped that step completely and just gone straight for the med room as a group with the weapons they had. If they were still determined to get to the car once they made it all the way out there, instead of immediately running for their lives at the first sign of trouble, they should have used the opportunity to take some of the cultists out while they had a chance. Dan has the keys, so if he could get the car started, he could have ripped around the parking lot while the other guys literally rode shotgun, blasting any of the creeps that that were crazy enough to stick around from the safety of the vehicle. We still don't know for sure if this is happening everywhere or it's just an isolated incident, but based on the fact that outside there aren't any signs of widespread chaos like smoke in the sky or sirens, there's a good chance that if they can manage to break through the cult, then they'll be home free. The next closest hospital is only 20 minutes away by car, so they should have been able to send someone for help either in the cruiser or on foot if they need to as long as they've taken out enough cultists to reasonably bet that they're no longer a threat. When they get back to the office, Dan is furious that Allison went for the meds by herself. Leaving the kid to look after the others, he tells Vincent to come help him find her, and as they're walking through the lobby, they notice that the doctor's body is missing. Down the hall, Dan finds the trooper's handgun laying in a pile of blood and guts. The two of them make it to the med room and load up on supplies before leaving, but there's still no sign of Allison. Just then, the phone in the doctor's office starts to ring. Picking it up, he sees that the call is coming from the hospital morgue, and that's when the doctor starts to speak from the other end. Dan demands to know what he did with his wife, but he responds that he wants to help them all before hanging up the phone. While the other two were talking, Vincent found a box full of disturbing pictures and a journal that ties the doctor to the cult outside, slipping the notebook in his pocket before following Dan back to the office. 
Okay, it looks like it's a little too late for Allison. They might be in a rush to get out of there, but now that we know that the doctor was behind everything all along, before leaving his office, I would have quickly searched around for any more hints that could give us an advantage in the next fight. Since he seems to be the leader of the cult, Maybe if we captured one of his followers alive, we could interrogate them for some answers about what he's planning to do and how to stop it. There could also be files in his office that explain what these mutated creatures are and any exploitable weaknesses that they might have. We still don't exactly know what we're up against, so right now, knowledge is power. And when you've got access to the head bad guy's office, it never hurts to take a little extra time to look around. After regrouping with the others, Dan tells them that he needs to try to rescue Allison since she's the only one who can properly take care of the girl and her baby. Kim's worried that the cultists might attack while they're gone, but he points out that they aren't trying to get in. They're trying to keep them from getting out, leaving them with a bag of medical supplies, the pistol, and an ax just in case. Before they go, there's someone else that they need to talk to. The three of them start interrogating James, threatening to break his fingers with a hammer unless he tells them what he knows. He says that the doctor was behind everything, and that he met a girl on the road who told him that she knew a place where they could get some drugs, only for them to be captured and horrifically tortured by the cult once they got there. Once he's done, Dan takes off his cuffs, but he isn't planning on setting the guy free. They're still going down to the morgue, and James here just got promoted from hostage to human shield. They make their way through the burned out area towards the stairs to the basement where they find tracks that looks like somebody was dragged along the ground. The door to the morgue should be right in front of them, but somehow the place has changed, and the hallway stretches out farther than they can see. When they get to the end, instead of a door, they find another set of stairs descending further underground. Vincent tells the kid to turn around and go back, but he refuses to leave them behind. And with James leading the way, they start climbing down into the darkness. Okay, I don't know what they're about to find down there, but I can tell you for sure that it's not going to be good. It seems like somehow the doctor has changed the layout of the basement and opened up new areas that didn't exist before. I'd circle back to grab a map of the building before going any further. There should be blueprints stored somewhere in one of the administrative offices. And if not, every public building usually has floor maps posted by the stairs and elevators to show you the way to an exit in case of an emergency. Emergency. While this still won't help you once you start getting down into the unmarked tunnels, it would be much better to at least have something to reference, instead of just going in blind and getting hopelessly lost in some mutant infested hellhole. Before going down those stairs, I would have told the kid to toss one of his flares in there. That way we'd know at least how far down they went and hopefully get a quick peek at what's waiting for us in the darkness below. Then all that's left to do is let our meat shield James lead the way and hope that we can handle whatever we might run into. Meanwhile, somewhere deep in the basement, Allison wakes up on an operating table with the doctor standing in front of her. She tries to ask him what's going on and he explains that after losing his own daughter, he started to search for a way to reverse death. Many of his early experiments weren't fully successful, leaving the people that he used as test subjects trapped here in the tunnels and transformed into hideous undead creatures. Now he's finally perfected the process, and tonight he plans to bring his daughter back. She begs him to let her go, but he says that it's already too late, turning around with all of the skin peeled off of his face and pulling back the sheet to show something huge trying to push its way out of her stomach. Okay, it looks like somebody should have waited for backup after all. Hey Allison, all you had to do was wait. Just sit still until Dan comes back with the shotgun. And then you could have gone together to get all the supplies that you needed. Little Maggie here might have been in pain, but when you're the only person with the experience to take care of her in this condition, then it's your responsibility to be patient and avoid taking chances that could easily get you killed or worse. We all know that the place is surrounded by a murder cult and possibly infested with unkillable inhuman creatures. So what could have possibly made you think that going off on a solo mission was a good idea? Honestly, it's pretty remarkable that with everything that's been going on, you somehow managed to find a way to make the situation worse. When a quick trip to the med room ends up with you carrying an interdimensional mutant baby, Allison, you have seriously up.
The men come to a pitch dark room with a giant sigil carved into the middle of the floor. And James says that he saw markings just like it all over the old farmhouse. Walking down the hall, they eventually find a doorway marked with a strange black triangle. And Dan cautiously makes his way inside while the others follow close behind him. It's a brutal scene, with horrifically mangled bodies hanging everywhere in sight. Shining their lights to the back of the room, they see this disgusted zombie repeatedly slamming its own head into a metal spike. It turns to look in their direction, and suddenly, a dozen more of the creatures rise up from the ground and begin to attack. One of them lunges out from the shadows and grabs Dan, but the kid blasts it with a shotgun, unloading on the undead monsters as they're quickly overwhelmed. With the zombies closing in, Vincent has a vision of his dead wife and child and takes off after them down the hall. Simon takes the shotgun and goes after the old man, while Dan grabs James and an axe before trying to hide in a room nearby. James decides to thank Dan for saving his life by putting him in a chokehold, but he quickly hits him with the reversal and throws him off. Backing up, he watches as one of the creatures drags the man away, pulling him around the corner and slamming his head into the ground until there's nothing left. Upstairs, Maggie starts to go into labor, and Kim realizes that she's going to have to perform an emergency C-section without any training or support if the girl and her baby are going to live. The old man begs her to do something, but suddenly, someone reaches up and slices his throat, and when he falls to the ground, she sees that the killer is none other than his own granddaughter. Maggie reveals that the doctor is actually the baby's father, and the lights in the building go out as the two of the cultists appear in the office doorway. Kim runs for an exit, but more of the cultists are already there to cut her off. So she blocks the door shut with her axe and slips away to hide in a storage closet. Okay, Kim here is in a bit of a tough spot. She's surrounded by cultists, with no backup coming anytime soon, which leaves her with only two options, hide or fight. Hiding seems like the safest bet, but sooner or later, you're gonna have to come out. And if the cultists manage to find you first, then I'm sure what happens won't be pretty. That's why I'd choose to go on the offensive. This way, if I go down, at least I'm taking a few of those psychos with me. This is gonna be tough, but now that he's dead, it's time to make sure that Gramps over here doesn't get back up and turn into one of those creatures. Instead of using the ax to block the door, Kim should have held onto it and gotten ready for a fight. The cultists are just going to find another way around, and when they do, now they'll have a free ax for their troubles. And I wouldn't want to give up my best weapons so easily. Since Kim works at the hospital, she has a better knowledge Knowledge of the layout of the place than anyone else there. I'd want to use this to my advantage and sneak from office to office picking off cultists one by one from the shadows whenever I had the opportunity. Hopefully I could take enough of them out that I'd open up a way to make my escape or at least survive long enough for backup to arrive. Simon chases Vincent through the tunnels until they come to a room that looks just like their house. The old man starts to lose his mind knocking the kid to the ground and forcing him to fend him off by sticking a lit flare into his stomach. When they both finally snap out of it, they realize that they're still trapped down in the basement. Meanwhile, Dan creeps through the hallways until he eventually comes to a doorway marked Delivery Room, and inside he finds Allison laying on the operating table. He holds her hand and promises not to leave but in an instant, she crumbles into dust, and he realizes that what used to be his wife is now a gory mass of writhing tentacles. Taking up his axe, he chops into the abomination over and over until she's finally put to rest. Suddenly, he's transported into a black room with several bodies on stretchers and a giant glowing triangle carved into the far wall. The doctor begins speaking to him telepathically, explaining that beings older than time itself gave him the power over death, and soon he'll complete the ritual to bring his daughter back. While Dan's distracted, Maggie sneaks up from behind and stabs him in the back with a huge knife, and he stumbles forward, crashing to the ground. The girl approaches the platform, and now the skinless doctor tells her that she's done well before turning around and placing his hand in the center of the triangle. He begins praying in a strange, old language, and the wall slides back revealing an impossibly bright light on the other side. Turning around, he puts his hand on the girl's head and calls upon the old gods to place his daughter into her as a vessel. At first, Maggie smiles until she suddenly screams and pulls away, but the process has already begun. 
and a giant, hideous creature bursts out from her stomach. One of the cultists immediately passes out, and the beast crushes their head like a grape before turning on Dan. But that's when the other two men show up and start blasting it with the shotgun. It chases them back into the dissection room, grabbing the older guy's feet with its tentacles and dragging him closer across the floor. Simon grabs a metal pole and slices the tentacle in half. Vincent raises the shotgun and shoots it point blank in the face, but the creature tanks the hit and stabs him in the chest. He covers himself in flammable liquid and the kid lights a flare, tossing it at his father and engulfing him and the creature in flames as he escapes through a nearby vent. Back in the ritual chamber, Dan stands up and slams his axe down into the doctor's shoulder, but the attack has no effect. Holding him by the throat, the man says that he can bring him and his wife together again if he'd only let go and embrace his death. And that's when Dan stands up, grabbing the doctor and tackling him through the triangle and into the glowing void. The triangle on the wall closes up and the building begins to crumble. Okay, I guess that's one way to get it done. As a general rule, when you know that you're in the final showdown, it's always better to attack during the villain's little monologue than to wait until he's finished. He's expecting you to just stand there and listen to the explanation, which is why I'd want to take him by surprise and rush him the minute that he showed his disgusting face. This way, I'd also avoid getting shanked in the kidney by that creepy little girl, if all else failed. Instead of tackling him into the void, I would have just tried pushing him in or sweeping the leg. Any attack that kept me on this side of reality. Since whatever's on the other side of that portal can't be good, I'd want to stay the hell away from it at all costs. After all, it doesn't count as a win if you also end up trapped in the dimension of perpetual torment. At least the doctor's out of the picture for now, but we still have to see if the kid can get out of there in one piece. The monster isn't dead yet, and Simon runs for his life through the collapsing hallways with it chasing right behind him. The walls around them start to close in, and he dives back into the hospital just in time as the creature is crushed inside. When he turns around to look, the hallway that he's just escaped from has completely vanished. The kid makes it to the office and finds the old man dead on the floor. In the next room, he sees a cultist with their head bashed in by a fire extinguisher. And when he opens the storage closet, Kim lunges out at him holding an axe. Realizing that the rest of the crazies are gone, the two hug it out, happy just to have made it out alive. Somewhere in the infinite void, Dan and Allison are together again, looking up at a giant pyramid floating above them in the sky. They take each other's hands, and the screen cuts to black. But what would you do? If you were trapped in a spooky hospital with a death cult right outside all night, would you pick up your phone and call for help? Or would you grab that shotgun and blast those mother into oblivion? Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe, and let us know what you would do down in the comments below. Also, this is a reminder that we upload on Wednesdays and Saturdays now. We'll see you in the next video. Oh, and have a damn good day.